Hello, everybody. I have got Johan with me today, and we are going to be talking about the idea of smart automation and using AI for good. But before I head into my questions that I've got for you, can you give everybody a quick introduction? Emma, thank you so much for the opportunity. I've been following your work and your videos for some time now, and it's always so informative. And uh, I just want to encourage you to keep on with the good work. Um, so, so my name is Johan Stein. I'm here in Johannesburg in South Africa. I currently work for a management consulting firm called IQ Business, but I'm heading over to PwC in two weeks, so quite excited about that. Uh, but just to stress that I'm speaking on my own behalf today, and just um, I'm also part of the Institute of Information Technology Professionals of South Africa, where I head up the special interest group on automation, uh, or sorry, rather, um, uh, artificial intelligence and robotic process automation. Well, thank you so much for the kind words. And I feel so excited to have you here and offer a different perspective. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so to get us started, I like to usually have kind of a level setting conversation to make sure we're, we have a shared definition as we head into the discussion. So can you start by sharing your thoughts on what smart automation is? And is that different or the same as intelligent automation? And kind of, we'll, we'll start there. Yeah, I think it's important, Emma, because it's kind of an apples for apples comparison. And, you know, I deal a lot with, with banking and financial services clients. And at the beginning of meetings, I always try and step back and say, are we talking about the same thing? Because I still get, people who think that AI and robotic process automation is the same thing. So they just throw these kind of words around. But uh, to answer your question, I, th I think to a large extent, smart automation and intelligent automation is pretty much the same thing. I think people use it in the same way. Um, but, you know, intelligent automation is really just the next step where we start using autonomous automation, where we start using machine learning and uh, looking at, at patterns and where um, really the it's almost like the touchless enterprise where we automate almost on the go through the use of this kind of technology so i think smartly automating and intelligently automating using this technology is pretty much the same thing in my opinion great and that's what i thought but i always like to double check just to make sure that i'm not headed in a different direction um so as we take a look at you mentioned that you're in south africa and part of why we wanted to have this conversation was to highlight the opinions and thoughts that are kind of coming out of this region of the world and really talking about how you're seeing your customers in africa use automation as a opportunity to become competitive on the international scale. Can you share a little bit about what you're seeing take place today? Certainly. And, and look, I'm so very proud about the work that companies in South Africa and in Africa are doing. You know, coming from a, a developing economy or the so-called third world, we often look at the Gartner reports and we look at Silicon Valley and what's been done in Europe and elsewhere. But then when I speak to people I know who have incredible startups yeah, in South Africa and in Africa, startups that often are sold to international investors in the US and Europe, we, we are doing some amazing work at a different scale, of course. I mean, the size of the market locally is you can't compare to Western Europe and, and the US. In South Africa, we have a very mature banking system. That's one of the reasons why we did quite well during the 2008-2010 financial crisis. Um, we have uh, banks that, uh, you know, like for instance, APSA, one of our local banks, was acquired by Barclays in, in the UK, and subsequently they had a bit of a divorce. But, you know, so even though it's Africa, and, and, and you know, I lived in England for a few years where people constantly ask me, do I live in a hut, and are there lions walking in the streets, <laughs> which I always laughed at, because, you know, once people visit the country, they say, wow, there's quite an infrastructure and amazing buildings and um, uh, roads and, and so forth. But on the other hand, we also have incredible problems. You know, we in South Africa, we have an unemployment rate of between 30 and 40 percent. The um, epidemic was was a massive strain on our economy, which brings us to the question of automation, because for us to compete globally as um, organizations, we have to automate smarter and faster and this kind of technology gives us the ability to do, to do that. But it brings us to the 
what do we do with all the people conversation? So I think, you know, I always stress when I speak to my customers and when, when I do talks like these, is you have to start with a people first conversation and not a technology or a platform first conversation. We have to, to think about societal impact. We have to think about the the upskilling of our people, the current workforce, but also the, the workforce that's coming in, you know, high school and, and university. But the, the organizations that I'm working with are to a large extent dealing with a lot of the same issues that you hear about when you speak to international um, customers or when you listen to webinars. It's about change management. It's about to find the right use case for this technology. It, as I said, the upskilling of your staff. But there are some organizations locally that I'm dealing with that I think is cutting edge, that's doing most likely uh, the same kind of amazing work as organizations and in the US and elsewhere. That makes me very proud. But we do have societal issues that are different than the likes of, of the US. I think it's so eye-opening to hear that change management and people first change. This is something that I am super, super passionate about. And that across the board, wherever you are on your journey is going to be a critical part of transformation efforts. Um, and you brought up some really good points that I wanna go into a little bit more here in terms of some of the challenges that maybe are a little more unique in terms of um, unemployment rate. But I, I think this is a universal topic as well. When we start to look at how we can use automation in these people-centric avenues, but also use these emerging technologies for good and make sure that we're not leaving people behind. Can you share some thoughts um, from your perspective on how we start to shape our emerging technologies and our maybe some of the ethics surrounding it um, to help make sure that we are including people in our journey? Mm. Uh, it's such an important question, Emma. If, for instance, if you read Yuval Harari's books, uh, Sapien and Homo Deus, and, and even if you read uh, Nick Bostrom and, and other thinkers, you know they talk about the potential that we are forming what they call the useless class. So there's a chance, if we don't do this right, that we will have a real minority of people who are super rich, super healthy, because we can genetically engineer ourselves more and more, and, and also the, you know, re-engineering the, the, um, the kind of health that we have in our children. And, and then we'll have masses and masses of people who, unlike in other industrial revolutions, we will just not be able to upskill. And think of the societal impact. Think of the global uprising and the chaos that that can cause. Now, I'm definitely an optimist when it comes to this technology. But, you know, I have a, a seven-year-old son, and, and I often think about the kind of future that is awaiting him. And I feel that we who work in this field, even though our influence might be small compared to the influence of big consulting firms, for instance, and, and you know, big opinion makers and social influencers, we have a responsibility while we can still control this technology to shape it for the betterment of ourselves and of our children. Now, here we can think of the bad, which is data and, and privacy, which is a, and facial recognition, majorly important topics. On the other hand, we can think of what it can do for education and for healthcare. And, you know, I'm working with some organizations here in South Africa where we're really looking at utilizing this technology for the good. One example I always like to use a friend of mine who is a professor at a local university. She's a medical doctor and she works in breast cancer research. And they go into the rural areas where there's no internet connectivity, there's often no electricity, there's definitely very little medical infrastructure. But they use ha a handheld device to do breast scans. They immediately connect it to the cloud and to machine learning algorithms. And they can almost instantaneously give a very probable a diagnosis um, of that uh, breast scan and the same happens for prostate scanning or or um, lung scanning so there's so much good we can do but you know that's a typical question uh, you know that challenge between making money and you know what happens typical and typically in a capitalist society and competitiveness but also not leaving people behind so it's a it's a great question around um upskilling it's a great question about 
connectivity, as I already mentioned, you know, in South Africa, we have a lot of challenges around just electricity supply, let alone internet connectivity. Um, so there's some very, you know, it's almost like we've been left behind on the first, second and third industrial revolution. So how do you now leapfrog into this fourth industrial revolution? I, I think as long as organizations work together for to upskill people, you know, South Africa is so well positioned as an offshore destination. In fact, recently, South Africa won some awards on the global stage about our capability to service the, the market. If you think of Europe and especially uh, England or, the, or Britain, you know, we're mostly an English speaking country. Our labor force costs are relatively low. Our connectivity in, in the main cities are great. So we can really compete with offshore centers like India, the Philippines and elsewhere. But from a societal point of view, there's a lot we have to do to make sure we don't leave people around. And, and maybe just to conclude the answer, it's not a nice to have. It's imperative for the future of our region and our country and the future of our children that we get this right. And this is something that keeps me up at night, not just my own son, but his friends and, and other children in this country who grow up with very little education and with no connectivity. So how can we both really enrich ourselves in the sense of commerce, be more competitive, but how can we make sure that the next 30 or 40 or 50 years uh, that we leave a world where our children are not left behind, given where, where the world economy is going with this kind of technology? It's really eye-opening from my perspective because a lot of the conversations that I've had um, are focused on obviously US or, or Western Europe and focusing on how do we take current employees that maybe don't have skill sets that boast well and help them upskill. But there is this whole other part of the journey as a society of how do we, how do these technologies impact us and what do we do to help support that? And, you know, it, it's a very timely conversation because I've been having a number of these chats with people from across the world where we're talking about what does upskilling look like or what do these programs to get children and teenagers and, you know, maybe folks that are outside of the workforce today, skill sets of, um, you know, these emerging technologies, get them interested in how this could potentially impact their career. And, and to your point, I, I hope from the optimistic side of myself as well, that, um, you know, some of the statistics that we see in terms of um, career opportunities and job growth that kind of supersedes and offsets some of the automation that we're seeing today comes to a reality, but it's going to take some work um, to help make sure that we're bringing these different populations that maybe haven't had exposure, um, the, the same tools and opportunities that the rest of us have been afforded. So I really appreciate you joining me for the conversation today and helping open my eyes and hopefully some other folks um, to a different perspective and a different lens on the, the conversation of upskilling and how we can use this technology to really drive our society forward. So thank you so much for joining me. And I wanna encourage everybody to make sure that you pop over to jo Johan's, see there I go with the J, Johan's um, LinkedIn profile. And um, he's doing some really great things in this area with, again, um, Africa and the use of these emerging technologies. So make sure that you check them out and um, do some digging of your own within the journey. But thank you so much for joining me today and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you, Emma. If you're looking for expert tips on how to get started with your transformation or looking to hone in on your approach, make sure that you subscribe to our channel to catch our weekly digital transformation talk series where we interview experts from around the world on how to make it happen.